Good morning. Man, if the flu can make you sing like that, I want it a couple times. That was good. Uh, I'm excited to, to be with you this morning. If you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 is where we going to camp out this morning. Um, before we get there, i got a, a couple things I just want to just talk to you guys about. Just uh, some things that have just been going through my head this week as, as I was, was thinking and preparing. Uh, one of the things that just really intrigued me, I saw some different articles this week, different things, was just how uh, this generation, this culture, um, is just really infatuated with animals and with pets. So I wanted to do just a quick survey. Um, if you are a dog person, raise your hand if you're a dog person. Okay. Now, if you're a cat person, raise your hand. I'm sorry. No. Uh, you put your hands down. Uh, I, 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 that's very interesting. I, I'm very much a dog person, so is my wife. Um, but I'm very much um, a dog person um, for, for your dogs. I, I like to play with them for a little bit of time um, and then give them back. All right. Uh, a couple of years ago, about three years ago, we, me and my wife were preparing um, to get married. And we were having a discussion. The biggest contention in all of our engagement was whether or not we were going to have a dog. And I, I absolutely did not want one. Um, they, they, they poop, they pee, they, they tear stuff up, they bark when you don't want them to. I did not want a dog for any reason. And, and my wife, she has never lived at her house without a dog. So she, she just fervently wanted a dog. So we compromised and we got a dog. Um, <laughs> That's how I always tell that story, but, but uh, Kirsten, she made me make sure that uh, I tell you that I'm actually the one that got us the dog. She didn't just come home and surprise me with it. Uh, I just wanted to love and serve my wife, so I, I'm the one that got us the dog. Uh, but, but I was just thinking this week, man, how much we, we love animals, pets in particular, and how that's just a relatively new thing. Right? For the longest time, um, you only had animals if they um, were able to do something for you. Other than bring you uh, pleasure and, and joy and excitement. But, but you had dogs if they were to, to herd your cattle. Or you had dogs that, that, uh, for hunting purposes. That for the majority of the world, that, that was um, why you had pets. But now in our culture, I mean, everybody has a pet. And we make pets out of everything now, too. Right? I mean, squirrels, hamster, I mean, snakes, everything. We make pets out of everything. But this week, I, I was also looking and, and just thinking about how protected animals are. And one of the things that is interesting to me is that um, one of the most grievous things that somebody can do that uh, we would just uh, write off from the very beginning is commit some type of animal cruelty. Right? That's just one of the most grievous acts that, um, that, that someone can commit in, in a lot of our eyes. And I was looking this week at some of the laws that we have. Um, some that, that I didn't know. If you were to kill a police dog, a police dog. The maximum sentence is 10 years in prison and a $100,000 fine for killing a police dog. The other that just really blew my mind was that if you were to destroy a bald eagle egg, not, not the bald eagle, but the bald eagle's egg, it's a maximum fine of $250,000 and two years in prison. And so, so we live in a culture, man, that absolutely values animals and, and, and life. And yet, in that very same culture, for $350, you can go to your local Planned Parenthood and kill your child that's in your womb. And man, I've, I've never heard of something more backwards. I've never heard something that made of less sense than that. But we're in a culture that, that, that so highly regards of life in every essence of the word, except for when it comes to humans. And like Dr. Tate mentioned earlier, tomorrow marks the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, which was the court case that legalized abortion in all 50 states. And in the 45 years, it's well over 60 million babies have been aborted. The reason we say it's well over California that leads the, the nation in abortion hasn't reported in the last six years. Over 60 million children have been killed. The largest genocide in all of history. And 
one of the things that, that I, I hope to do this morning is because I'm going to share just a few statistics with you, just a, a few things just to, um, to, to just hopefully break your heart for, for um, the injustice that we are experiencing. One of the things I heard recently, recently is that the death of one is a travesty, but the death of a million is a statistic. So I hope and pray that that wouldn't be true for us. I'm just saying that 60 million babies that have lost their life in the last 45 years, um, that, that wouldn't just be a number, but that we would recognize as, as 60 million souls. People that didn't have a chance. And one of the things I want us to see when we're, we're talking about some of these injustices is how the church has failed miserably to combat them. Not, not only failed to combat them in many ways, but have also contributed to them. Now, I want to just bring that in just a little bit. We're talking about 6 million. That's across the nation over 45 years. I want you to think about it. In 2016, we don't have 2017 numbers, but in 2016 alone, how many abortions do you think there were at Planned Parenthood and Mobile off of downtown? Right in our city. I asked some, some friends of mine that, that, that same question last night. My wife, she, she said 80. And I pray that it wasn't that high. 1,202. 1,202 in one year in our city. And that is unbelievable to think about. In our own backyard, a massacre of over a thousand children. And yet I was having a conversation with, with, with a friend and acquaintance about two years ago. And then this individual, uh, she was pro-choice. She said that the mother has, has every right to terminate a life inside of her. It's her body, she can do with it what she pleases. And my friend said, well, why do you, why do you think this way? And she said, I, I'll tell you why. This person at the time was taking care of one of her family members' child, children. Because that, that family member wanted nothing to do with it, couldn't take care of herself. So she said, if that same family member got pregnant again, I would tell her, I would demand of her to go get rid of it, to go take care of it. My friend said, I said why? said, because uh, I can't take care of it. I can't afford it. I can't uh, bring that burden on myself. And my friend, she eagerly said, but that's what the church is for. Right? The church is supposed to help you. And the acquaintance said, well, where is the church with this one? And we couldn't say anything. Because one of the realities is, is the church has advocated for years for the sanctity of human life, for, that we have just been pro-life. We, we've marched for 45 years, one of the longest um, going protests in all of history. We just did it on Friday, marching for life in Washington, D.C. And yet we've done incredibly little to actually care for the mothers and the childs that actually commit to life. And say, hey, I, I, I won't do this. I won't make this choice. Um, I, I will choose life. And then that's the last that, that we talk to them or, or help them in any way. Leon Scrum, he says it this way. He says, I think there's a big difference between being anti-abortion and pro-life. Anti-abortion means you have a conviction that it is murder to kill a child in the womb. It's a good position. But to be pro-life means that you not only want that child to enter the world, but that you want that child to thrive when they enter the world. It's not just about getting children into the world, but about making sure they flourish as human beings once they're here. 
So I love how, how he redefines the terms because for the longest time we haven't actually been pro-life, for life. We've just been anti-abortion. Those are drastic, drastically different. So I, I want to take just, just one second, just a couple of disclaimers before we go any farther. The church has, uh, in, in many ways, done some awesome things in this arena. The Women's Resource Center in Sarah Land and in Mobile do incredible ministry. If you give to our church at all, it goes to those ministries to give women help, resources, um, to, to know how to take care of a child, uh, and, and, and different things. There's people in this church that served and volunteered in, in those vicinities. So I'm not saying that we've just failed miserably in every area that we're talking about. But what we're, we're focusing on this morning is just ways that, that we have not only um, not combat these problems, but actually contributed to them. The other disclaimer I want to mention is that um, statistically, one in three women have had an abortion. So just doing the, the numbers, that, that means that there are several in this room. And if that's you, or, or some of the other sins that we're going to talk about in just a little bit, have you, if you have committed any of these sins, I want you to know that God's grace is sufficient for you. God loves you, God cares about you, and he wants to forgive you. All you have to do is ask him. No matter what sin, God's grace is sufficient for you. Okay, so I, I wanted to make sure that, that we have that as, a, as our foundation. But even in that, even in God's forgiveness, does it mean that we can't, that we won't make changes, that we, that we don't need to make some changes going forward? Because we have to. We have to make some changes. The, the second thing I want us to really look at is that, that nearly half the population in the world about three billion live on less than two dollars and fifty cents a day. Another one point three billion live on less than a dollar twenty-five per day. So that's, that's over half the world's population lives on less than two fifty a day. Twenty-five thousand children. Twenty-five thousand children die every single day from starvation, from lack of clean water to drink, and preventable diseases. 25,000. And now, uh, there are Christian organizations that do many things to contribute to those needs. But the overwhelming majority, the average American Christian living in the top 1% of the world, lives frivolously with their money, regularly commits gluttony to the point where it is the norm. And, and could, couldn't care less about half of the entire world's population starving. Right? It is easy for, for us to say, out of sight, out of mind. The last thing I, I really want us to look at, and it's one that, that, that really tugs at my heart. And this is going to be a wide range of numbers, but between 20 million and 30 million people are enslaved today <coughs> to human trafficking. Between 20 and 30 million people. The, the largest percent of that is, is forced labor. I mean, maybe some of the things that you're wearing was, was made with forced labor. But the, the largest growing percentage of that is sex trafficking. And one of the things that, that grieves my soul is how, how the church has, has um, contributed to that. Is the statistics um, in the church and the world look the same in a lot of areas. One of them is, is divorce. We talk about that a lot. Another one is, is porn viewership. And the church has said that 85% that of males 
watch porn at least once a week. 85% of males in the church and two out of three women performing on screen on the internet have either been coerced or forced through sex trafficking. And it's, and it's easy to, to think, or, oh, man, I only watch consenting adults, but, but what we're doing is, is we are increasing the demand. And whenever you increase the demand, you must increase the supply. So not only do, do we do a poor job in fighting against this area, but we contribute to it as a church. And there's many other things that, that we can talk about. The more than 170, 170 million orphans in the world. The over 6,000 um, kids in foster care that need care in our state. The over 500 homeless people um, in Mobile alone. But there's so many injustices in the world, and we, we can't talk about every single one of them, and, and it just becomes overwhelming as this giant mountain that can never be conquered. And if you're, if you're anything like me, you're thinking, okay, where do we start? Because right? I, I hope and pray that, that, that you're thinking, okay, I, I want to do something about this. I need to do something about this. But with, with statistics like that, it can be so incredibly daunting that what happens often is that we get so discouraged that we'll never even make a dent that we don't do anything. So what I want us to do is, is look to the scriptures in Ephesians chapter 3. And see what, what, what God did Paul just begs and pleads with us to do. But before we go there, I want us to pray one more time. That God would, would just use this. I want you to, to pray with me. That God would convict us. God would challenge us. God would uh, speak clearly to us through his word. Lord, I, I love you. <laughs> And I, I'm grateful for the many blessings you have bestowed on me and the people in this room. Lord, and I pray that we would not take any of those for granted. God, I, I pray that you would just spend this time making us more and more <coughs> like you. God, I pray that our hearts would break for what breaks yours. God, that we would delight in what you delight in. God, I pray that we would be passionately committed to prayer and to constantly seeking your face on behalf of others. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I said before, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 14. We're going to work all the way to the end of the chapter in verse 21. And then we're just going to unpack just, just God's um, outline on how we're going to deal with, with these issues. So starting in verse 14. It says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know that the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, there's a lot going on in this passage.
passage. And, and um, what was interesting is the way God just kind of orchestrated. Um, this was a, a topical series, but we ended up preaching through all of, of chapter 2 and 3 of Ephesians. Um, so, so that's important to know because it starts out with for this reason. Anytime a passage starts with something like that or, or because of this or uh, therefore, you need to know what the author is referring to. And, and, and Paul, in this passage in particular, gets a little bit off track when he starts chapter 3. Right? He, he, he begins to start this thought, but then he, he chases a rabbit just a little bit. So what he's actually addressing is what happens at the end of chapter 2. I'm just going to read the last three verses of that. It says, I'm built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, it, it clearly lays out the gospel in verses 1 through 10. And, and how that, that, that God saw us in our, our wretchedness, in our, uh, our sinful state. And he still sent his son to die for our sins. Just so that we could repent and, and, and believe in him. Be reconciled to the Father forever. Because he had that power in the resurrection. And then verses 11 through the end of chapter 2 talks about how that, that now that we have been uh, saved by Christ, we are now one with Christ and becoming more and more like him. And he is the foundation of all things. And so now um, Paul transitions. Be, be, because of that, Paul outlines exactly what he is praying for the church in Ephesus. But the first thing I really want us to see is that, that God is the author and creator of life. You really see this in verses, verse 15. It says, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. Man, this is one of the great themes all throughout uh, Scripture. How, how God is the creator and sustainer of all life. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And when he, when he created a man and woman in his own image, he looked at them and said, this is very good. He used just a good for, for the rest of creation. But then when he transitions to mankind, he says, this is very good. Now, now, the reason I really want us to focus on this first is because we must have this as the foundation. That God is the creator and sustainer um, of all life. So whenever we have an inventor or a creator of something, what we, what we must do is go back to that creator to find out its original design for the product. Right? That, that's... What, what we must do, because if not, we're going to misuse it. We're not going to treat it the way it's supposed to be treated. Because the, the creator of something is the one that intricately designed it. Know how it's supposed to work. Knows, knows how it's supposed to be cared for. And that is infinitely more true about the God of our universe. That created each and every person in this room. And so what we have a responsibility to do is, is go back to him, go back to the scriptures to, to know and understand of how he has wired us, how we are to be cared for and, and to care for others. Because I've seen too many times that, that, that we uh, talk about the sanctity of human life and that we are, are, are pro-life and all these things and the, the foundation is not Christ. And it has to be. Because it's in Him where we get our intrinsic value. It's not based off the, the creation. It's based off the Creator that formed us and knew us. So we must have the foundation that, that God is the author of life. He's the Creator of, of every person in this room. And God says that you are valuable. He says that, that you are, are fearfully and wonderfully made. That you're made in His image. 
So we, we must believe that. And, and if you really start there, and if you, we really believe that, then we would value life from the womb to the tomb. Not just the nine months of pregnancy, but we would value that life after it's been born. We would value that life um, through kindergarten. We would value that life when um, they can't fend for themselves when they're 85 years old. And, and we would value that life when they're in a coma. We would value all life. When we understand and comprehend that God values all life and He's the only one that has a say in the matter. So that must be the foundation, the groundwork. And then from there, now we can, we can move forward a little bit. So if we can't agree on that, then we can't move forward. But we have to understand and believe that God is the creator and sustainer of life. And since He is, we must look to Him on how to treat life, how to care for life, how to love and serve one another. Verses 16 through 19, I, I pulled two different points out of here. So I'm going to read them um, one more time. So in verse 16, it says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So this, this is Paul's prayer. You get uh, just a glimpse into his prayer life, and this is what he is actively praying for the Ephesians. And so there's two things I really want us to draw out of these verses. And first is that, that we pray for ourselves. We must pray for ourselves on this issue. We must pray for ourselves. <clears throat> One of the really interesting things that, that he mentions a couple times in this passage is that, that Paul desires for the church at Ephesus, for their desires to line up with God's desires. For God to, to change their hearts in such a way that they would love the things that he loves. And care about the things he cares about. And that's what we desperately need. When we pray, God um, changes our desires. Prayer changes our desires. And man, I, I don't know about you, but that is um, so important for me. Because my sin is, is wicked and deceitful above all. And it often um, tries to convince me that, that my desires are more money. A larger house, longer, more often vacations... And there's so many times when I had to, to fight that flesh because um, my desire wants to satisfy me. It wants comfort and pleasure. It wants all the things that, that it's not promised a single time in all of Scripture. I mean, Paul, the guy that's writing his letter, a better Christian than you, he says, I, I, I do the very things I don't want to do, and I, and I don't do the things that I want to do. He, he continually needed his desires formed more and more into the image of God. And so do you. Amen. So we want to first pray, uh, God, uh, change my desires. God, help me to love the things that you love. A quick way to answer um, that prayer yourself is to be in God's Word. The more that we're in God's Word, the more that we see what God desires, the more that we see the, the over 3,200 verses of how God cares for, loves the orphan, the widow, the oppressed, the downtrodden, the outcast. And the more and more we, we, we come to know Christ, and the more and more we see those things, the more and more our desires become His. And not whatever selfish desire that, that we are abiding in right now. But that doesn't happen overnight. That takes um, persistent prayer. Ongoing prayer. Saying, God, make me more like you. God, help me to desire the things that you desire. Next, prayer changes our power. 
Prayer changes our power because without Christ, we are completely powerless. There's nothing that we can do. All these issues that we mentioned earlier, all these problems, and there's so much more. I mean, the, the amount of lostness in this world, all these things, and we are completely powerless to combat. But yet, we have the opportunity to tap in to the greatest power source in all of existence, the God of the universe. And all it takes is prayer. It's prayer that, that allows us, it gives, that, uh, gives us that opportunity to tap in to um, his almighty power to accomplish anything far more than we can think. The passage tells us in just a minute. The prayer changes our power. Jonathan Edwards says this. He says, there is no way that Christians in a private capacity can do so much to promote the work of God and advance the kingdom of Christ as by prayer. So we're talking about, um, you want to know where to start, what you can do, it starts with prayer. Prayer is not what we did before the word. Prayer is the word. Because um, prayer changes our desires, prayer changes our power, and prayer changes our lives. Prayer changes our lives. And the more and more we petition God and go before Him to, to change us, man, I, I promise you, that's a prayer that, that God will answer. I mean, I've seen throughout my life, there's been many times that I've prayed selfishly for different things. There's been many times where God didn't answer those things. Because I made those about me. But what Scripture teaches, He teaches us some things that, that He will answer each and every time. Pray for wisdom. God gives wisdom abundantly to those who ask. When we pray to be more like Him, that's a prayer that, that God um, always answers. Prayer changes our lives. So, so first, we must acknowledge that God is the creator of all life, that he is the author of life. Second, we must, we must pray for ourselves. Right? Because the reality is that those, those issues that we mentioned, I don't know about for you, but for me, um, there, there's a lot of those issues I have done absolutely nothing to help. Those are issues I've done far more to contribute to than I have to help. <coughs> and so first, God must change our desires, must change who we are so that, that he can work in us and use us to combat the darkness in this world. So we must pray for ourselves. And secondly, out of these same verses, we must pray for others. We must pray for others. And, and we, we see this example that, that Paul has, that he's giving us. He's even telling the church in Ephesus, these are the things I'm praying, praying for you for. So there's two different ways this needs to, to look like. There's two different groups that we need to be praying for. And the first, we need and we must be praying for other believers. Praying for the church to step up and do its job. To care for, for all people, to love and serve others. That's, a, that's an ongoing prayer that we must have. And you see, even in this list, some specific things to pray for. Pray for strength. Pray that, that their wills will line up with God's wills. One of the things that I've done this week, in just preparation for this, and, and just God really convicted me of this, of praying for other believers to act more like Christ. One of the things I did, I said, God, I, I just really want to be just really intentional on this. God, give me four people. Give me four people in our church. Just impress them on my heart to, to pray specifically for. In this arena, that I, I can pray for daily um, by name. And God just really impressed on my heart just four names. And I've spent all week just, just fervently praying for them that God would, would use them mildly, that, that they would um, make less of themselves and make much more of Jesus. They would sacrifice their, their own desires for His desire. 
are you praying for other Christians? Because the reality is, um, this is a daunting task to overcome the injustice of the world. And, and we can only do it with God's power, but we, can, we must do it together. We must do it together. <coughs> so we must pray for other believers. Regularly. It's like Dr. J mentioned his prayer. If God answered all your prayers that you prayed in the last week, would anybody's life change but your own? I don't know if some of you might be saying, well, you just told us to, to pray for ourselves. I promise if you pray the prayers that we were just talking about for yourself, it's going to change how you pray for others. If you pray and ask God to change your heart and your desires and your passions and convict you for what convicts his heart, it's going to change how you pray for others. So first of all, we must pray for other believers. Secondly, when we're talking about praying for others, we must pray for victims. Every, every person that, that we just mentioned about, uh, the, the mothers that, that have killed 60 million children in the last 45 years. We need to pray for those moms. We need to pray for the ongoing deaths of children every single day. We need to pray for the orphan, the widow, the fatherless. An ongoing. But one of the things that, 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 that practically, one of the reasons that, that Paul was able to pray specifically for the church in Ephesus is because he had been there. He had spent time with these people. So he knew what they needed. He knew that that strength was something that they really needed. He knew that they were easily distracted by their own desires and own pleasures. So what that means is that, that we not only pray ambiguously for the um, 4.3 billion people in the world that live on less than $2.50 a day, that means that, that we try to engage people that aren't like us. We try to engage people that are, are suffering from, from poverty, from, from homelessness, from uh, Abortion that, that, that's dealing with that guilt. Now you can't meet every person, but you can meet one. You, you can engage one foster family that, that's committed to, to take care of children, and, and you can bless them and serve them and love them as they radically transform the life of a child. You can commit to, to foster care. You can serve in that capacity. And, and you can um, help serve and bless one orphan. One um, child that doesn't have parents to love and care for them. But God wants us to pray on a large scale. But, but he also wants us to know people that we can specifically pray for. We can specifically invest in. And through God's power, change lives. So what are some, some arenas that, that you can enter into to, to encounter people that are suffering from some um, severe injustice? So that you can um, begin to know how to pray specifically. Because that's so important. That we pray for ourselves. And we pray for, for other Christians, and then we pray for every person in this world that is suffering from, from injustice, that doesn't know the love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We must pray. The last thing I want us to see is that we expect God to work. We must expect God to work. Verses 20 and 21 it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And that's an incredible two verses. That this God that we're talking about, that we're praying to, he's the one that is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think. Richard Aline says it this way. He says, the reason why we obtain no more in prayer is because we expect no more. 
God usually answers us according to our own hearts. First thing is, that's God is able. God is able. He's able to do far more abundantly than we can think or imagine. And so there's nothing outside the realm of possibility when we are praying to our God. There is no prayer that is too big for Him. <coughs> but do we act like that? Do we really believe that? Do we pray big, expectant prayers? Second thing, I mean, God is able, but also God is willing. And the more and more you, you look throughout Scripture, you see God's heart. For the outcast, I mean, look at Jesus' ministry. He spent the, the bulk of his ministry with people that, that nobody else wanted to spend time with. With people that couldn't care for themselves. So God is willing. But basically, Pittman, he says it this way. But God in his sovereignty limits himself to the prayers of his people. So God is, is able to stop all injustice. And, and he's, he's even willing to do it. But in his sovereignty, he limits himself to the prayers of us. He limits himself to the prayers of us because he wants to, to do his work in and through you. That was his design. So God is, is able and God is willing. And lastly, and extremely important, is that whenever we begin praying like this, we begin praying for people, we begin praying for ourselves, and, and acknowledge honestly and wholeheartedly that, that God is the foundation of all of life, the author of life. Once those things start, start happening, God will move, and God deserves all praise and honor. Every bit of it. Read verse 21 again. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. When we pray and ask God to move and to work in these different situations and these different people's lives, when he does, <coughs> he gets all the honor and all the glory. And when maybe he doesn't answer prayers like we think he should, he gets all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. Because he is worthy of it. He deserves it. So, I, I may not have given you the answer that, that you I thought maybe you were looking for. Whenever we were just really discussing at the beginning, all right, where, where do we start? How, how do we deal with this? Because if, if you're like me, I'm very practical. Right? So I'm thinking, all right, what money, um, what organization do I need to give money to? What, what mission trips do I need to go on? What, what things do I need to do? Uh, Nothing is impossible apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. We must first and always pray. It's not what we do before, it is the work. Guys, I, I'm asking and begging and, and pleading with you to commit to this truth about Jesus and to pray fervently for yourself that God would change your heart, change your desires, make you more like Him. And He would allow you to tap into His power and be used by Him. And that we would fervently pray for others. Pray for others to do the same. Pray for people to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. What we're going to do now is, is I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. We're going to enter into a time of invitation. We'll have a song. And, and you can sing. You can come pray at the altar. You can pray where you are. You can just do whatever the Lord leads you to do. We just want to be here for you. Because if you're anything like me, this past week has been extreme conviction and repenting the majority of the week. So 
So we just want to give you a couple of minutes. <clears throat> do whatever the Lord needs you to do. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we are, we are grateful that your grace is sufficient. Because, God, we have greatly betrayed you in many ways. <clears throat> it is common for us to, to not love and care for the things that you love and care for. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us. <clears throat> God, I pray that you can fix the brothers and sisters in this room that don't think they have a problem in these areas. Search our hearts. Know us. See if there be any wicked ways in us. God, reveal them to us. And show us what you want us to do in those areas. And God, I just pray that we would be a people that loves people. More importantly, loves you, but which translates to love for people. God, I pray that, that we would love and care for, for mothers that, that have had an abortion. God, that's for mothers thinking about that decision, Lord. I pray that we would care about the homeless in our community. I pray that we would care about the people experiencing severe poverty in our world. I pray that we would, we would care about the people stalking human trafficking. Love you, we think.